Hello, my name is Ranger Dawn, and on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, welcome to Mystery Cave. A Mystery Cave is part of Forestville Mystery Cave State Park, and we are located in the southeast corner of Minnesota in Fillmore County in the beautiful Christmas area. Mystery Cave is the longest cave in the state with just over 13 miles of survey passage. And it is the only cave in the Minnesota State Park system to be protected as a Minnesota State Park. So we're going to begin our tour in the cave in a room called Devil's Kitchen. And as we walk down to the cave, as we walk down to the cave, think about this question. What what is um, what is the key ingredient needed to create these amazing places that are right below our feet? Well, think about that, and we'll answer that when we get into the cave, and I will meet you there. Cool. We're here in Devil's Kitchen, and if you think of the, question, the answer to that question, what is the key ingredient needed to create these amazing places that are right below our feet? Well, I was thinking of water, and hopefully you were too. Water is the key ingredient. Well, we know about the pathways water creates on our surface landscape from the rivers and streams that we see. But what about the pathway water cars when it goes from the surface underground? Well, to understand that connection, we need to know a little bit about the geology of the state. And so, about 450 million years ago, during the War of Mission period, Minnesota was covered by a shallow sea. And Minnesota was also located closer to the equator at that time. But during the War of Mission period, the shells from the animals that lived in the shallow sea at that time gradually slipped to the bottom of the shallow sea and began to compact and cement into sedimentary rock like sandstone, shale, and limestone. So if you look at the wall here, the blocks right here are the limestone. And during that time, it was a relatively calm, warm period. But there were, in between that, there were more turbulent periods where rivers Deposited mud and silt, creating these shale bedding plants. Now, about a half a million to a million years ago, flood waters dissolved the limestone along the bedrock tractors, creating most of the street caves. However, if you look down here, you can see these big break down rocks. And if you look up on the seaweed, you can tell that well, it fell from, from the ceiling. This is called collapse, and it is collapse that has created some of these smaller rooms like the one we're in today. So, I have a trivia question for you. Acidic rainwater also carves our surface landscape above the street cave, creating thousands of sinkholes and other car species. Here is Fillmore County. And so in the land of 10,000 lakes, how many lakes do you think are found here in Fillmore County? Well, I'll think about the answer to that question and we'll answer that in the next room. Did you think of the answer to that question? In the land of 10,000 lakes, how many lakes are located here in Fillmore County? Well, it's a bit of a trick. It's a bit of a trick question, actually, because there are no lakes here in Fillmore County, and the reason for that is because this, the rock here is like Swiss cheese; it can't hold any water, and that sort of landscape is called karst. Karst is a landscape made up of porous and soluble rock like sandstone, shale, and limestone. And it is also a holy land. And I mean that literally because there are sinking streams, springs, sinkholes, and caves. And I am standing in front of one of those Swiss cheese holes right here. 
And down below us is the disappearing river. It is the river that flows through the lower level of Mystery Cave. And if we're really quiet, we can hear the river flowing below. So if the rock is like Swiss cheese, what are some of the considerations people should have for when living on karst? Well, think of septic systems or pesticides or other agricultural chemicals. Water and pollutants flow very quickly through the bedrock down to our groundwater. And Mystery Cave acts as a conduit which transports water and those pollutants very quickly downstream. The water that flows through Mystery Cave here flows into the South Branch Root River, then onto the Mississippi, and eventually the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the water that flows through this cave, it emerges just a few miles from here in a world-class trout stream. When the water is underground, the water is cool, and trout need cold water to survive. So if it wasn't for the cave, we wouldn't have the trout there. Well, when the water is underground, the water is also cooled, but it doesn't evaporate like it would on the surface. So caves are much better in reservoirs than our surface landscapes. So it is the pathway of water through the cave that connects us all. So one of the things that I find most powerful about caves is this way of the cave recovering and allowing us to experience the past. So imagine we are going to walk back in time to the Ordovician period before, before dinosaurs roamed the earth. What would it be like? So we're going to walk to our next room, and as we're going to do that, see if you can imagine what it would be like. Well, did you imagine walking back in time, back to the Ordovician period, long before dinosaurs roamed the earth? If you think back, remember we talked about how Minnesota was covered by a shallow sea, and that sea was teeming with life, crinoids, cephalopods, coral reefs. And when those animals died, and their shells sank to the bottom of the shallow sea, some of their bodies were preserved as fossils. So if you look up on the ceiling here, we have... <laughs> so if you look up on the ceiling here, you can see the fossil of a cephalopod. Cephalopods are extinct now, but they are related to squid. Cephalopods grew to 15 feet long, and their shells were on the outside of their body. You can see that they're shaped like an ice cream cone with the point at the end, and their head was located near the top where the ice cream would sit. So caves have a way of sparking our imagination. But caves also demonstrate the immensity of time and provide us with a window to the past. So we've peeked through a couple of those windows in the past already. Let's look through one more at our next stop. Mm -hmm. Do you need that lighter? That's the tail of the cephalopod. Ready? Mm -hmm. Well, going up, did your parents lean you against the wall and draw a growth marker above your head? Did they put a date on it? And certainly that would remind you of a certain event. And lots of change happened between those lines. Well, bedding planes are similar and can tell us about climatic conditions at a particular time in Earth's history. We, we learned about the calm and turbulent periods in our Earth's history already. 
This is the, the last window back in time. If you look right here, this is an iron oxide, iron oxide stained shale bed. One of these bedding planes. And in it has a thin layer of bentonite. Now geologists get excited about the bentonite because it formed at a particular time in our Earth's history. And so this gooey layer of shale, bentonite, developed during a time when plates were colliding, creating what we know is the Appalachian Mountains, or what we call the Appalachian Mountains today. Now, Mystery Cave ha has this bentonite layer throughout the cave, and it is also found in 18 other places, including the Mississippi River, in Mississippi River Valley. So we learned about the role water plays when creating Mystery Cave. Water dissolving, water removing. Water also plays an important role when it comes to speleothem development. We're going to see that process in motion at our next stop. CO2 from organic matter, such as plants, as it seeps through the ground to underground. Uh, when water and CO2 mix, it becomes a carbon dioxide. And as it seeps down through the ground, it dissolves away some of the limestone, contributing to the development of cave passage. CO2, or carbonic acid is the same thing that makes the fizz in your soda. So remember that next time you drink one of those. But when that acid water reaches the cave's air, the CO2 gases, very much like when you open one of those cans of soda and you hear the fizzing coming out. But what's left in that water is a mineral called calcite. Calcite is in your bones and in your teeth. So think back to those ancient sea creatures that lived in, in the ocean back during the Ordovician period and their shells and the calcite there. This is where this comes from. But for every way that calcite based water deposits, it can drip or flow or even pull up. For every way it deposits, you get a different type of formation. For instance, soda straws are these little hollow calcite tubes. They develop when a little ring of calcite deposits on the ceiling, and ring after ring, you get a, a soda straw. Eventually, that soda straw is going to spud, and it's going to force the calcite-laden water to the outside. And that's when you get a stalactite. And you guys know the opposite of a stalactite, right? A stalagmite, right? Stalactites cling tight to the ceiling. Stalagmites might grow up someday. And when a stalactite and stalagmite grow together, what do we call them? A column. <laughs> when the calcite laden water flows down the wall of the cave, you get formations such as draperies or flowstone. As it continues to flow down, you'll get these pool formations and rimstone dams. So water plays an important role when it comes to the development of these formations. But without the water, the formations would stop. So these formations are very beautiful. Uh, so we're gonna move on to our, our next stop. And as we're doing that, I'd like you to think about what lengths should we all go to to protect and allow access to this cave? So let's talk about that at our next stop. So the question was, what lengths should, should we go to to protect a cave? Well, discovery in 1937 facilitated the destruction of this pool here. When the cave was first discovered, in order to extend the, the tour through to the back of the cave here, or beyond, beyond where we're going today, they drilled 
and dug a trail through it. So if you look at this pool right here and look at the other side of the wall, you can see that this pool extended to both sides. So people often ask me, how long or how, how long does it take for formations like this to form? Well, 1937 was about 80 years ago. And if you look on the, on the, on the, the passage right here, you'll start to see in areas a thin layer of calcite beginning to grow. And so if this developed, if a thin layer developed in about 80 years, 80 years is an average person's lifetime, how many lifetimes do you think it would take for a formation of this size to grow? So anyway, fortunately, not everything was destroyed and we have these beautiful pools left here. The round formations right here are called botrioids. It's a Greek word for grape. And they develop when there is seeping calcite-laden water depositing over the, the rock here. And so anyway, knowing what you know now about, about how this passage was developed, perhaps that question of what lengths we, should we go to to protect this has a different meaning. So knowing what we know now, perhaps that question, what lengths we should go to to protect this cave, has a different meaning. Was developing the cave the right thing to do? Should we restore it? If we do restore it, that means that this passage would be filled in and the tour would stop uh, ahead of us and we couldn't go, go on. What about the education value of the cave? Perhaps that changes your point of view as well. These are tough questions. There's no right or wrong answer. But these are often issues that land managers and even private landowners have to deal with often. So I, I am reminded of a quote do not always run from the darkness. Remember the beautiful lakes which are hidden inside the dark caves. In the least expected places, there exist the most beautiful treasures. And that treasure is ahead. In the early days before DNR purchased the cave, there used to be a post right here in this room and the guides encouraged visitors to, to drink from this water. I don't know if, if that would be a good thing to do today, but remember that caves are conduits for our, our groundwater. So if you've eaten corn or beef raised in this area, it may have been watered with water that went through Mystery Cave. Caves are unique because of their interconnecting, interconnectedness of so many wonderful things. When we leave the surface and go from one extreme to the other, we discover that caves are its own environment defined by water. So, so you can't talk about caves without talking about the surface. One, one is reflective of the other. Thanks to another side of the cave. And this, this side, uh, they brought electricity in here, but we don't use it for tours, and the whole tour route isn't really in way. So this is the more rustic tour called the Lantern Tour. This is exciting. At the entrance of the cave, you have the big blocks of limestone. This is a lower level. We'll see that we'll see the lime. Oh, you can see it up here actually, but down here, this is called Stuartville, and when this developed, there the there were thick layers of mud and not a lot of oxygen in the shallow sea at that time, and during that time, there were a lot of worms that lived in 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 the mud in, in the sea there, and these are the casts these holes are the casts that the worms made.
The passages are beautiful, they're sculpted and sinuous. This is my favorite part of the cave. This is where the bats are. Although we will probably won't be seeing any this time of year. They should be out and about right now foraging for insects. You know, when you were, have you ever walked along the sh along the seashore and you can see the the ridges that waves make? Right? This is another clue to how we know that the Minnesota is covered by a shallow sea, because these are casts of those wave ridges. You know, in the sand. In the, oh, there's a little animal too. I get excited about the animals that live in caves. <laughs> Probably a little fungal gnat right there. Hello, little guy. But when you look up on the ceiling, you can see the casts. You know, as limestone, as, as the, the limestone deposited, it made the casts of the waves on, on the ceiling there, too. went up in elevation, and so we're back in the Dubuque, back in the, the, the big limestone blocks with the bedding planes that separate it. They're called, they're called rear raccoons. Okay, so, so in this cave you have the consistency of, of water flowing like, like music. It is, it is sound, it is sight, it is, it is feeling. And so that sound, that sight, that feeling is reflected here figuratively and literally. The blue color we see in this lake and Turquoise Lake, the other lake that we are at, is, is caused by the, the Rayleigh scattering by calcite molecules when light shines into the water. The, the light, um, the calcite molecules selectively scatter the, the blue light back towards you. It's, it's the same process that, that makes the, the sky appear blue. But, the cones themselves, these are really interesting. If you look in the water here, you can see a thin layer of calcite. And those are called calcite rafts. And they float on the water using the tension of the water, very much like a, a water strider does, using the tension of the water. But over time, that tension is going to break, sometimes because the water, these water levels fluctuate quite a bit from, from winter to summer, or you know, something drips or falls in from above. And that calcite raft is going to sink. And this process repeats itself over and over and over again. Those rafts building on top of each other creates these cones. And some of these raft cones are over six feet tall. So remember what we were talking about uh, when we were comparing just a thin layer of calcite to uh, one person's lifetime. So you try to imagine how many lifetimes this would take to develop. 
All right, so now that we're out of the cave, how did you get into this line of work? Well, when I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I figured that, as I grew up, that that, to, that would be very difficult to do. I, I don't know if I really have the... I, I don't know if I'm that smart to be able to be an astronaut, actually. So um, I thought, well, the other, the other direction is, is just as interesting. And it, it started with uh, a friend of mine who's uh, a doctor. She works at the, teaches at the Western Kentucky University Center for Cave and Car Studies. And I was reading information on the internet one day and I emailed her because she talked about the volunteers that she works with. And I asked her if I could volunteer with her, not knowing anything about caves. And, and she said yes. And I've been, uh, I've been doing this ever since for over 20 years now. How did Mystery Cave get its name? Well, when the cave was discovered in 1937, the, in the winter of 1937, the men that were working on it and developing it, uh, pulling buckets of mud in and out of the cave to build the trails, said they, one, one of the men said to the other man, it's a mystery why anybody would want to work in this cave. They were working in hard conditions, it's muddy, it's wet, it's cold and the word mystery just stuck. What's the most interesting thing you've seen in the caves or what's your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of the job, my interest is studying the animals that live in the cave, the invertebrates. There are cave adapted animals that live in this cave. They were, they're related to their surface cousins, millipedes, crickets, spiders, but they were pressured underground because of advancing glaciers and back, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. And they have had to adapt to this cold, wet, dark environment. So many of these cave adapted animals are tiny. Uh, they have no pigment. So they, you can see their, their organs right through their skin. They no longer have eyes. Their appendages are much longer now because, you know, that's how they, they smell and travel around in the cave. And so studying those animals, uh, I find, are, are really interesting. And we're discovering new species all the time. If you're interested in caving, there are several organizations. The Minnesota Speleological Survey, which is a grotto or chapter of the national organization, which is called the National Speleological Society. And members of the MSS are trustees of Mystery Cave, and so they know how to travel through the cave, and they're allowed to have the keys to the cave, and so just like any other recreational opportunity, caving is also a recreational opportunity. So if you want to go caving, I would suggest contacting someone from the Minnesota Speleological Survey, and I'm sure they'd be happy to take you into Mystery Cave and, and learn all about caving.